So uh, last week we talked about how grace and peace are multiplied in our lives inside of the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ. And we had the fancy whiteboard out here last week, um, and we got to draw how that literally, like, it meant like if you had a big circle that was literally the knowledge of who God is, grace and peace would be inside of that being multiplied through you gaining knowledge of who he actually is. It's not, it's not gaining knowledge in a cold theological facts type of sense. It's like accurate, per- precise, experiential knowledge of who Jesus and God actually are. And I think there's a big difference because you can read um, you know, a bunch of theology books and not really intimately know Christ. And there's a big difference. And so we talked about grace and peace last week. This week I want to dive in to the next verse. Um, and we'll go ahead and jump in at Second Peter 1, uh, verse 3. It says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to or by his own glory and excellence. And so I want to read it again. His divine power, God's divine power, has granted, freely given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. And so last week we talked about just grace and peace. This week, Peter basically just gives us everything. He says, everything pertaining to both life and godliness have been freely given to everybody who's a believer through the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ. And so I want to kind of dive into that a little bit. One, just starting off with all things. And what does that mean? Well, kind of means all things. Um, But if you look it up in the Greek, it's kind of, it talks about everything, but with a focus on each individual part that makes up everything. And so think of it as like a big puzzle, everything, but there is a focus on each individual part. And I think that'll make a little bit more sense um, later. And so he's freely given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And godliness is like a reverence for God or a godly heart response. But the thing I want to focus on most is everything pertaining to life. And the word that Peter uses here for life in the Greek is called zoe. If you've been around uh, our church for a few years, you may have heard Jordan talk, uh, Pastor Jordan talk on the different uh, words for life that are used in the New Testament. They pretty much all get translated into just life when you're reading it in English, uh, but there's three distinct words used for it in Greek. One is bios, which is where most people are probably familiar with at least the origin of that, right? Biology. It's like your physical, tangible life. Like if somebody comes up and pinches you, that would be your bios life. And then there's psyche, which is like the part of you that makes you who you actually are, right? It's part of Carlos that makes Carlos Carlos. It's part of Vernon that makes Vernon Vernon, right? Um, for the good and the bad and everything in between. Uh, but psyche is what makes us us. And then this one right here that we see in Second Peter is Zoe. And it's always, always used in reference to eternal life and the life that we have in Christ while we're here on this earth. So if you look in, I believe it's Romans 6, 4, we were therefore buried with him through baptism unto death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Same scripture, or that scripture uses the same word, which is zoe. So that life that we have in Christ Um, You know, Ephesians talks about we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We've been raised to life in Christ. That life that we have in Christ is Zoe, here in the present and for eternity. And Peter tells us that we've been granted everything that we need for our life 
in Christ through the knowledge of who God is. So it sounds like understanding and truly knowing God seems to be a pretty big deal. And I think oftentimes it's probably not our default go-to when we're struggling in life. Whether we're struggling, you know, not necessarily with sin, although it could be, but struggling in our marriage or our work relationships or with our kids, um, regardless of what it may be, the answer really to everything for our life in Christ is getting to know him. If you were here last semester, we kind of talked about that in several different ways, but it's to get to know him. And the thing that I think has been stuck in my head all afternoon praying through this um, is we have everything we need. God's granted it to us. Literally, he's freely given us everything we need to be, quote, unquote, successful in our Christian life through the knowledge of him. So what's stopping us from actually getting to know God? And if you were here last semester, this first part may be a little bit of a review, but if you weren't, well, it'll be fresh information. Um, I think a lot of what stops us from getting to know who God really is is our own broken picture of who God is. That was shaped uh, by religion. Maybe we grew up in a really legalistic church, or it was shaped by parents who are very, very... uh, Christian looking when they go to church, but they go home and they're just bigots and hypocrites. And you as a little kid didn't know how to navigate the reality that they say this God's loving and all this stuff, but the parents who say they serve this God go home and they treat me like garbage. And, and as a kid, you don't know how to wrap your mind around that. And so you grow to not trust, not understand, um, and not go to that God because you don't like that God. And even having an experience later in life where you truly give your heart to the Lord doesn't erase all that stuff that happened to you as a kid or happened to you even as an adult. Like, you still have that stuff to try to fight through. And so I think one of the main things that keeps us from really getting to know who God is is literally our broken perception of who he is. Because I don't know about you, but there have been times in my life where Based on what I'd done, the last place I wanted to go was to God, even though it really was the best place I could have gone. My own broken view of him made it to where it seemed like it was the last place I wanted to go. And then we run to everything else, whether it's, you know, burying yourself in your job. Um, Some people lash out in really other very destructive ways. Um, You know, you divorce your wife and go to Las Vegas and marry a stripper and buy a Corvette that's yellow, right? Um... We kind of always all have different ways to cope with it. Some are just more obvious than others. Um, But when we find ourselves feeling like I genuinely got saved, I genuinely had a moment with the Lord or a season, but now I feel spiritually empty and like I don't know what to do, this is telling us that really the remedy to that is getting to actually know our Heavenly Father. But ironically enough, I think the very reason you don't know Him is why you don't go to Him. Because of your broken view of Him, you're scared to go to the very thing, the very being, the only being in the universe that can actually heal you of the things that are causing you so much pain. And the thing that was on my mind the most, and I know this may only apply apply to a few people in the room, it may only apply to one or two, Um, but I think one of the biggest things that keeps us from really getting to know God is, I don't know how else to say it besides like habitual sin in your life that makes you feel like garbage. 
at the end of the day. Like, I, I remember, you know, when I first got saved, and, like, struggling so bad with lust and pornography that you feel like God's the only thing that can heal you, but you feel so unworthy that you don't feel like you can go to him. And it creates this weird cycle where I think you do a couple things. One is you promise to never do it again, whatever it is, whether it's drugs, alcohol, uh, sex, you have a raging temper and you just get angry all the time and you lash out and you say a bunch of horrible things to people you love and then you get done and you just feel dirty and sick inside and the first thing you do, you promise, like you grit your teeth and promise I'm never going to do it again. Um, and then you try to find all of these weird humanistic, seemingly half-holy things to try to resolve the issue that's going on, like, you know, put up a bunch of barriers in your life or or you have a swear jar in your house and every time you rage out you got to give money to your wife so she can go buy a new purse. I don't know what it is. But you have these ways of trying to fix something that's broken with something that's broken and that's you trying to fix you. And I can promise you it doesn't pan out too well. Um, you may kind of get over certain sins but I've noticed that just kind of sin shifts from one thing to the next, you're not really healed. But I remember feeling so just ashamed and like unworthy of God's love and not feeling like, feeling like I had to get at least moderately, at, not as a believer, not as an unbeliever, as a Christian, I felt like I had to get cleaned up a little bit more, I think, or like go through a couple days of doing better and then God and I could be back on somewhat better terms so then I could actually go to him and he would be willing to meet with me or he would be willing uh, to teach me or kind of let me back in. And, and I wasn't even really raised in that a lot. Like I had a genuinely a pretty solid upbringing. Um, you know, Terry Broom, if your wives love her, that's my mom, big haired lady uh, that's always smiling. If you come on Sundays, you're bound to get bombarded with a hug. Uh, and that's genuinely who I grew up with. And so I didn't even, I didn't really grow up with a really bad view of God. But I know the thing that gave me the most wrong view of God was what sin did to my mind in the sense that it gave me a very warped view of who God was. And it was like that habitual sin almost didn't let me get out, or at least felt like it didn't let me get out of that warped view of who God was. And I think that's one of the reasons um, that God truly hates sin so much is because of what it does to his children and their view of who he is. So I want anybody in this room who feels like that, or maybe you're struggling with something over and over again, worry, anxiety, whatever it is that just makes you feel like dirt. I don't know what it is for you, but you're letting it stop you from getting to God and you're making all these uh, weird empty promises like you're never gonna do it again. And then, you know, maybe it's later that day or the next day or a week from then, you do it again, you're like, well, shoot, me and God were on good terms, but now we're back on bad terms. And what I felt so strong was like, if you're an alcoholic and you leave here and you go get hammered after this, God still wants to meet with you tomorrow. Or if you're addicted to pornography or drugs and you go use in whatever capacity immediately after this is over. So I... God wants to meet with you. And that, like, 
he sees your soul for what it is and it's in chains and, and he wants to heal it. So, if that's you, God wants to meet with you tomorrow. Regardless of what you've done tonight, regardless of what you do after this, and it's not, don't get it confused, it's not like a license to just sin and do whatever you want, but it's that in your brokenness and your struggle, you go to God because he's the one that loves you and can actually heal you. God knows the, the damage that sin's done to your life. He knows the damage it's done to your mind. And you, you can't restore that brokenness inside your own soul, but he can. And he does it by showing you who he really is. But if you don't go to him, you're not giving him the opportunity to know who he really is. And you won't intimately know God through me. And you won't through Pastor Jordan. And you won't through Terry, if you listen to her online, because I know some of the men do. You won't get to intimately know who God is through anybody else except your own relationship with him. You can listen to all the sermons, all the podcasts, all the stuff in the world, and those aren't bad things. It's not a bad thing to be here. It's not a bad thing to, you know, allow the Holy Spirit to speak into your life through Jordan or Mom or whatever you listen to. But they're a catalyst that hopefully, hopefully sparks something inside of you to where you actually have the confidence to meet with God the next morning because that's where transformation happens. That's where everything you need for your life in Christ you can actually get. And maybe it's not overcoming some addiction or habitual sin in your life. Maybe it's just, you know, you and your kid's relationship is crap and you don't know what to do. I'm telling you, if you get to know truly who God is, you're filled up with him in such a way that, I don't know, he can do something through you that like naturally you, you, don't, you can't do. There's a goodness in God that we don't possess, that when he's working through us, there's a healing that can come to our relationships and our lives uh, that's truly only by his power. And so, I want everybody in this room tonight to know that, that you can go to him regardless of where have you been. And I think the... I think the thing I always felt like I struggled with was it was one thing to be a really rotten sinner before you know Jesus, but what do you do when you are still a really rotten sinner after you know Jesus? And that was always weird to me. Like, what do you do when you have raging sin and dysfunction in your life and you genuinely know the Lord? And the answer is you get to know who he actually is. And most likely... If you have some type of habitual sin in your life, tonight, tomorrow, the next day, probably won't be the last time it happens. I remember I was talking to somebody one time, and they were upset because they were like, man, I, I drank again or something. They were just really hard on themselves. I'm like, one, it's okay. Two, it's probably not the last time it's going to happen. So when you demand too much perfection out of yourself, you're kind of always constantly disappointed. Um, and so know that... It's a process. Getting to know God is a process, just like getting to know uh, your spouse was a process. You know, it's kind of like when I went, when I first saw uh, my now wife, who was then just some random girl at college that taught group fitness, first time she walked to the gym, I was like, dang, girl. Um, and I was like, she is so hot. And I'm sure she'll watch this, so she'll feel super uncomfortable as I'm telling this story. Um, but I was like, dude, she is so hot. And then I had a mutual friend that knew her. Uh, and then that mutual friend told her, Rachel, she was like, hey, that guy out there in the gym thinks you're hot. And her first response was, well, he's kind of got big ears. <laughs> and I was like, well, man, it's kind of disrespectful. 
But I guess she got over the big ears and it panned out. So we've been married since 2016. Um, but I remember one of the first times we hung out, like it was, if you've ever been on like a first date and there's, there's so many butterflies, you get home, you're like, man, this, like, this might be it. Like they were amazing, they were sweet, they were nice, whatever else. Like you've had an encounter with them and it's amazing and you can't help but talk about it but you don't really, really know them yet. That's a crude example kind of of salvation. Like you, you get to know, you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You've had an encounter with him. You're genuinely excited. Like it's real, but just like a first date with somebody that you're genuinely excited about, you still don't really intimately know them. It's like that when you get saved. Like you've had an experience, your spirit's been raised to life with Christ. There's something different, right? You can tell there's something different in you, and you don't really know what to do about it. Um, I remember when I first got saved, it was like all of a sudden I knew all the wrong motives of my heart instantly. I was like, huh, Scott, you just did that because you wanted to be seen. I was like, ooh, I did. But there's still a huge process of actually getting to know who God is. And really in this life, it doesn't end. Maybe it doesn't end for all of eternity. But it's a process, and don't feel bad if you've genuinely given your heart to the Lord, but you, you don't really know him. That's where we all start. So go to God, regardless of where you are tonight. He wants to meet with you in the morning, and he'll begin the healing process. It doesn't happen by you trying to buckle up your bootstraps and get better. Like He'll begin it. He who began a good work, and you will be faithful to finish it. Um, and so... I'm not going to get to verse 4 tonight. I don't want to go into it. Um, and so that last question, uh, table leaders, will make no sense at all. Um, but I will pray, and then we'll go into discussion time. Father, I thank you uh, just for your spirit, Lord, and for your kindness. Um, Lord, that you would be pleased to dwell among us, Father, that there's eight billion people on this planet, Lord, and you care uh, so much about each and every one of us, Lord, that you genuinely want us healed, Father, that you genuinely want us to come to you, that you want us to get to know who you are, Lord, and that you know above anything else, Father, that's what transforms us, is getting to know you, your character, that you're patient, that you're kind, that you're compassionate, that you're slow to anger, Father, that you're meek, that you're gentle, Lord, I pray that you would uh, break down any walls and any men tonight that keep them from coming to you over their own brokenness. Lord, I pray that you be with the table leaders in the discussion tonight um, and that you just be honored and glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.